So my um, idea here for the TED grouping is that you know, science is a great problem solving tool. The problem is, is that it fails us constantly. It fails to give us the kind of information that we really need to produce decisions. So what should science look like in the 21st century if it's really going to be helpful to us in a problem-solving context? Now, the work that I do is mostly on environmental problems. And environmental problems are really characterized by social conflict and scientific uncertainty. And scientific uncertainty really usually has to do with knowledge conflicts. There's information that people don't agree upon, and so there's a conflict there. And scientists are looked to to help solve that conflict. Knowledge conflicts kind of go like this. Under conditions of high stakes and scientific uncertainty, that creates disagreement. And that disagreement leads to conflict, which leads to polarization of people, which leads to entrenchment in positions, which leads to polarization and conflict and disagreement and conflict and polarization and entrenchment. And this thing goes on and on. And the end point is that there's really no solution. So we scientists are supposed to come in and again provide the information that brings a solution. So what's, how does science do this? What is the model that it works under? And the model that we're trained as scientists to, to kind of believe in and work in is called the techno-rational model. It's a great name, techno-rational model. And the way this works is that scientists, here's our scientist over here, and scientists work in isolation from everybody else because that's what makes you unbiased. And that's why people can trust you as a scientist because you're working in isolation from the people who care about what's going on. So it protects you and protects your information. So you can see how unbiased our scientist is. You can see expression, okay, <laughs> totally neutral. And that scientist in this model then gives information to professional managers, usually in the government, who are also totally unbiased. You can see the expression there. And also, this person has their eyes closed. They're really, really unbiased. And that professional manager is going to make decisions, and those decisions are going to be received by a very appreciative public. So there's our appreciative public. So it's a great model. The problem is, is it really didn't work. Um, because here's one of our appreciative public people, and that person is not yelling, gee, thanks. As a matter of fact, he's probably yelling, I'm going to sue you, because most things ended up in courts. And so really, things kind of spin around with nothing ever really happening. Problems are rarely solved. So it wasn't a great model. So the new model that people are working under is called the multi-stakeholder deliberative model. It's a great model again. All these models are great. And the idea here is they put all these people with different opinions of what should be happening in a room, and they say, talk about it come up to a consensus decision, and they'll implement that decision. How do you think that's working? Well, eh, maybe, maybe not. Um, but the idea is that a consensus decision really requires people to agree upon the information that they're being given. If you can agree upon the information, you might be able to agree on the decision. If you don't agree on the information, it's unlikely to be very helpful. So there's one of the things that we're going to try to do. So my project was to look at social complexity. So first of all, what are the barriers that people have to accepting and understanding each other's information? So that's the social complexity part of this. And then scientific, ability, or scientific validity, how do we as scientists provide information to people that they can accept? So therefore, move on and make a consensus decision. So that's what we're going to try to look at. So there's a bunch of different types of information, but usually they can be divided into two types, anecdotal information, and that's what's going to be based on personal experience and observations. And that's really different than scientific information, and that's why scientific information is really so powerful, because there's a whole set of processes that you have to go through so that you have confidence that that information is true. So it's better than just things that you've developed from your personal experience which may or may not be true, or observations that you're making that may or may not be true. So scientific information is really different. And I looked at scientific information in a couple different ways. One is single source information. Single source is kind of the traditional view of science, where your scientist works in isolation from all of their interests and stakeholders so that it's unbiased. And then paired source, this is when groups of science, two scientists from different interest groups are going to work together, and multi-source when you have three or more interest groups working together. So that's kind of a little foreshadowing here. 
And the way I did this is I, I went to New Zealand as part of a Fulbright Fellowship um, to try to understand how this process might work. Because I had spent years and years fancying myself as a conservation biologist. And I'd published in great um, journals and things. But when I looked, I said, I really haven't accomplished too much conservation. I've published, but that's really different. Um, so I wanted to understand why I was failing as a conservation biologist. So I went to talk to people that are part of one of these multi-stakeholder groups in New Zealand. And New Zealand, they work on marine protected areas, MPAs. And they're really controversial there uh, because once an area is set aside as a marine protected area in New Zealand, all human activity is off limits. So there's a lot of battling that goes on when they try to establish one of these marine protected areas. So I interviewed a bunch of people that were different stakeholders that were commercial fishermen, conservationists, management, recreation, and scientists. So I, I interviewed these people to find out how they were thinking about information that they were given in this context. And to analyze it, I kind of made up my own scale. Um, and it runs from 1 to 100, like most scales really do. Um, and so the idea was that people were going to be sitting, like the scenario I created was people are sitting in this room, and information is coming to them. And what they knew about the information was who was providing it. So was this particular stakeholder, was it coming from a commercial fisherman? Was it coming from a conservationist? Was it coming from somebody representing aquaculture interests? That's all that they knew. It wasn't this is the information that's being provided, just what was the source? Who is getting that? Who is giving you that information? On my scale of 1 to, 50, one, to 100, um, 1 is totally rejecting the information. Um, 50 is going to be the tipping point of change, where you're starting to go, hmm, I might really be doubting what I thought before. My preconception, I might be doubting that just, just a touch. And then up here on the top, on 100, that's when the information is so good that you're actually changing your mind and you're flipping your position. So people would, would look at this information that I was giving them, and they'd rate it on a scale of 1 to 100. And I'd use that to calculate what I called overall acceptance values, OAVs. And this was the mean score for the entire MPA group together in aggregate. Okay? And then we'd look at that. So that's how the MPA group as a whole really viewed the information. And then I calculated group acceptance values. And this is the mean score for each one of these stakeholder groups. So how did that particular stakeholder group accept the information that was coming from this particular source? So that's kind of the, uh, the scoring method. So again. 1 to 50. So you can figure if it's 1 to 50, no mind change is occurring. 50 is the tipping point of doubt. So as you get higher from 50 up towards 100, you're getting a stronger and stronger piece of information that you're starting to trust a little bit. And if it's 100, you're actually going to say that you changed your mind on the issue. Because that's what's got to happen, right? All these people are, are coming to these um, forums, and they all have certain beliefs already. And they're there to try to convince everybody else that their belief is true. And that's how they're going to come to the consensus. OK, so you're going to get a lot of numbers here. And the way these numbers are going to work, um, again, one to, um, 100 is the scale. And if the numbers are below 50, the information isn't really going to be terribly valuable. People aren't going to believe it. It hasn't reached that 50 point which just when this little bit of doubt starts creeping in. So this information isn't going to be terribly helpful for the group. Um, then we'll have some marginal information that's in the 50s. You know, That's when that little bit of doubt is starting to creep in. And then information higher than that um, you're starting to get things that are maybe starting to get people to question their beliefs and maybe even change their mind a little bit. OK, so here's some real information here. So this is an OAV, or overall acceptance value. So this is the acceptance value for the entire MPA group in aggregate. And the people that are going to be speaking are government scientists, uh, commercial fishing, aquaculture, non-government scientists, conservation, recreation, minerals and energy, management, tourism. So all these people are speaking at this group. And this is anecdotal information. So they're all sitting in this group, and they're all providing what their thoughts are. So let's see. Again, aquaculture, recreation, minerals and energy, when those people spoke, nobody's really listening. Their acceptance values don't even hit that tipping point of doubt. Then. Commercial fishing, conservation, management, and tourism, nah, people I might be listening a little bit okay, in the 50s. Um, the good news to those of us that are scientists is that we really are seeming to be given a little special status in these groups. And uh, information, anecdotal information coming from scientists is up around the 65%. So people are listening to it a little bit more, probably not changing their mind, but at least listening to us. So now we can kind of drill down into this a little bit more and look how the different stakeholder groups thought. So over here, we have stakeholder groups. 
And up here we have the sources of information again, and then these are all your acceptance values. Lots of numbers. They told me not to use numbers in TEDs. What can I do? <laughs> okay, so this is a cross-case comparison table. So the way it works is if you want to look at what commercial fishing stakeholders thought about different pieces of information, you can read it across this way, across the table. If you want to know what the group as a whole thought about government scientist information, you read it down this way. Okay, and again, that 1 to 100 scale. 50 is the tipping point of doubt. So let's look at, at who liked what information. So if you look at government scientists, who liked the information from government scientists? Who scored it the highest? Well, management scored it the highest. Now, managers, of course, are always working for the government. So who liked government science information? What government managers did. Well, let's look at over here. Who liked commercial fishing in, in, information? Why commercial fishing people did. Um, we didn't have any aquaculture people in my sample here. How about non-government scientists? Who liked their information? Who scored it highest? Scientists. How about conservationists? Who liked conservation information? Conservationists. You guys might be seeing a pattern here. <laughs> um, how about recreation? Who, who liked recreation? Who gave them the highest score? Why, recreation people. We didn't have any minerals and management, but management people who thought management gave the best information? Why, the managers did. So we've got a little interesting situation here where everybody believes themselves. But that's not terribly helpful. Who didn't they believe? Well, let's see. Let's see these low numbers. Commercial fishing, who didn't they like? Conservation, 20. Recreation, 44. Tourism, 43. Basically, if you're not an extractor, the commercial fishing people don't like your information. Conservationists, commercial fishing, 38. They returned the favor. Aquaculture, <laughs> 20. Recreation. So for conservation, if you are an extractor, they don't want to believe your information. And this kind of goes on with these different groups. Uh, recreation, didn't like commercial fishing too much, uh, or minerals and energy. Management, they didn't like. Um, you can see the scientists here not listening really to commercial fishing, aquaculture, recreation, minerals management, uh, and management people. So you can see there's a lot of things that aren't really being listened to. So what did we come up with here? Well. What we came up was that stakeholders accept information from their own group or people like them, and they reject information from groups that are outside their own thought community, and the less they're like them, the more they reject it. But that's not a surprise to us, right? Because this is anecdotal information, and that's why we count on scientists to give us information that people like and trust better. Okay, so let's look at our scientific information. Here we have our scores down here. And we have minerals, conservation, commercial fishing in the 50s. We have government, non-government in the 60s. And this new category I stick in you. If people do the research themselves, or if people, uh, yeah, if people do the research themselves, because again, this now, you're having scientists coming in and providing research information to the people. So if people did the research, in, in, excuse me, did the research themselves, they had high confidence in it and placed a lot of value on it. Other than that, not too high. What's interesting is if we compare this to the anecdotal information, because science is, is a special type of information, um, we find that minerals and energy went from 47 to 56, kind of a good jump, but conservation stayed pretty much the same, commercial fishing stayed pretty much the same, government pre pretty much the same, and non-government scientists stayed pretty much the same. So we didn't buy ourselves that much with all the effort of doing actual research. So the good news for the multi-stakeholder deliberative people is that putting people around a table seems to be almost as good as actually having scientific information given to them. <laughs> the bad news is that none of it is going to change anybody's mind. So therefore, you're unlikely to reach any consensus under this situation. So we've got a problem. And if we can go down here, I'm going to skip this a little bit because we're running out of time um, already. Uh, but you can see the same kind of things. We look down here, um, all these commercial fishermen not liking conservation, conservation like not liking commercial fishing. You get the, get the pattern. If you did the research, you're going to get up in, the, in high scores. So stakeholders accept information originating from their own or similar research groups, and they reject information coming from research groups that are not similar to their own thought community. So again, the same results really for scientific information that we got for the anecdotal information. 
Now I'm gonna play a little thing here because my real job is I put tags on whales to see what they're doing underwater um, and try to solve problems that way. And the reason I'm showing this is because my epiphany where we're going next with this information started when I was tagging whales back in the early 90s. And I went to a fishing group and I said, I need to have you guys change how you fish because you're catching these endangered whales and they're dying in, in your fishing gear. And they said, no, they're not. And I said, yes, they are. And they said, no, there aren't any whales where we fish. And I said, yeah, you fish in critical habitat for right whales. There's lots of them there. And they said, no, they're not. And I said, yes, they are. And they said, no, they're not. And I said, yes, they are. And they said, no, they're not. And so we were stuck in this great knowledge conflict that was escalating all the time. And so I said, hmm, I think this time um, I'll actually charter a fishing boat to help me tag whales. So I said, this really makes sense. So instead of doing research away from the people that really care, maybe what I should be doing is doing the research with the people that really care. That diversity of information that, that Kevin was talking about earlier. So let's see if that works. So in this particular um, research project, I said, well, let's look at information that we actually pair the research groups together. So instead of scientists working by themselves in isolation, we'll make them um, come together into groups. So these are the different scenarios that I gave the people, and they're paired. So you get, get non-government conservation, uh, government and commercial fishing. You can see the, the different groupings here. So again, they're paired. And let's look at their scores. These are the OAV scores. So now, the lowest ones we get are up here almost to 60. The highest ones we get are up into the 70s. So these are considerably higher than the things that we saw before. So here we have the cross-case comparison, so the same kind of thing. We've got a bunch of low stuff, say non-government and conservation doesn't work well com for commercial fishing, uh, commercial fishing and government doesn't work well for conservation. But we've got some marginal ones, and then we've got a bunch of really high ones. A lot of these things up in the 70s and really up into the 80s. So, Right here, we can see commercial fishing and conservation, minerals and energy and conservation, and government and non-government um, are really coming up with the very highest scores. And these are pairing of polar opposites. And when you talk to the people about why they scored these very highly, they would say, because there's balance there. We can trust that information because there's balance. There's the people from the two polar groups. They're going to keep that research honest. So therefore, even if we're not there, we can accept that information as being valid. So they had faith in pairs of scientists that were like them. That's nothing new. But they also had faith in pairs of science that were polar opposites. And I kind of coined the term research by champion for this. Because if you can't be there yourself, and you can't always be there, but if you can take a scientist or accept a scientist from your own interest group and pair them with another scientist from another interest group, that that information then suddenly becomes quite valid in the eyes of these multi-stakeholder groups, and probably for the rest of us as well. So I called that research by champion. And I decided to continue this pattern. So more and more, I gave them opportunities with grouped researchers. So here we have a, a grouping of three, four, and even five. So the, the triplets have scores up into the high 60s. The fours have scores up into the 70s. And the largest groupings, the all-in groupings, up into the 80s. So almost as high as if you'd actually done the research yourself with these large, diverse groupings. And then the, really the important one is right here, um, where we have the commercial fishing and, and c conservation, the groups that are really always at loggerheads and polar opposites, um, and their acceptance scores for this information has almost come together into the same numbers. So you can see how powerful this type of information can be. And so the, the balance provided by researchers that included diversity of views, same with our last speaker, was really, really powerful in providing information that could be accepted. Um, those with the greatest diversity had the highest numbers, even in these large groups. Those with the least diversity had the lowest numbers. And so I coined the term team of rivals. Okay, I stole the term, <laughs> or the phrase team of rivals um, to describe this type of research, um, but I think it really does describe it fairly well. Um, so the conclusions here are that solving contentious problems requires information that's accepted by everybody if you're going to come to this consensus, and that's what's required in this day and age. Um, scientists focus on the technical aspects of problem solving, but it's the social aspects that are the buggers. They're the ones that cause their information to be invalidated and not accepted time after time. And by combining this diversity of views, 
you can actually get information that is accepted by these multi-stakeholder groups. And I do this not only in a theoretical component as you're seeing here, but I actually for years have been applying this to my own research. Um, so for instance, here we actually moved the shipping lanes um, that go through the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary where I work. People said it couldn't possibly be done. Well, we went and worked immediately with the commercial fish, or excuse me, the commercial shipping industry and the conservation groups, and we started doing the research together with them right away, uh, right from the start. And after about six months, we came to an agreement of where the shipping lane should be. And once we came to that agreement, it sailed through the policy process in only like three years, which was really fast for those of you that know <laughs> policy process. So, thank you.